nanohub.org. So we were in the ITM, we were in the Project Navigator, and we had learned how to execute one test, but how would I execute multiple tests? Well, the Project Navigator acts as both a test manager and as an automation execution engine. And what that means is this. Um, if I double click on a test, say the VDS ID test, that will open up the test in my multi-document interface. That test is open now, it's ready to run. If I double click another test, maybe the VCE IC test, I will have a second test open here and I'll have a second tab over here. Those tests are open, they're ready to run. So by double clicking a test, it opens it and I can execute it even if other tests are open. It's not a problem. If I single click a test, it doesn't open it, but it's still executable. So I might have a threshold test on the screen, but I might be running an input output test. Okay. So I need to be aware, um, in my measurement window of what I actually have open and what I'm actually testing. Okay. So I can add as many tabs here as I want and then click between tests using the tabs instead of using the project navigator. In other words, each test and each tab correspond to each other. Now, since the Project Navigator is also an execution engine, we had to have some way of controlling what tests were going to be executed. So what we did is we added a checkbox to the front of every level of the Project Navigator. The checkbox is really an enable, disable box for that test. So if I come in and I click the VDS ID test and I open it up and it's there in my multi-document interface, if the checkbox is not checked, it won't run. The green run button will literally not be green. <laughs> it will be some dim green or something gray or something. Okay. So the checkbox is an enable disable button. So that's, that's a very important thing to remember because when we added checkboxes, everybody kind of missed that point. So what they, what they did is they would open a test and they'd say, Oh yeah, here's the test I want to run. How come my green run button isn't lit? Well, it's because you didn't check your checkbox. The checkbox has got to be checked. Okay. But here's the real power of the checkbox. If I come up one level to the four terminal NFET, to the device level, and I single click on the device level and hit the run button, it will run every test underneath that device automatically. But it'll only run the tests that are checked. So this gives me a way to go from a single test to an automated test without any programming with a click of a button. And the check boxes enable that. Okay. So to execute um, a project plan or a test, I execute them using the green run button and I stop it using the red button, but I execute it based on selecting the level where I want to run the test. If I want an individual test, I click on VDS ID. If I want all the tests under the device, I click on the NFET. If I want to run every device under the subsite, I click on the subsite. And then if I want to run all the subsites, I can click on the default project and it'll run everything underneath there. Now, while it's running, I can go in and I can open tests and I can look at them and I can uh, see what the data is and I can close them back down again. I don't need to do any saves. It will automatically do all the saves for me. Okay. So our project navigator acts not only as a data management tool, but also as a test execution engine.
Now, the next area I wanted to talk about is the mess, the uh, message area. Okay. The message area gives me information about the tests as they're running or as they're about to run. So, um, the message area will tell me, um, I can configure it in different ways. It'll, it, there's a log file that runs it and it will tell me information about, about the test, when it was started, when it stopped, why it stopped, if there was something that caused it to stop. It's, it's a message area that, that talks about the test. In general, in a research environment, you actually can close this whole thing and not even look at it because you're interacting with the test one test at a time. You know, you really, you really can tell what's going on without that. So how would I build a new project from scratch? Well, you know, Keithley supplies dozens or even hundreds of predefined projects. But a lot of times you may want to start a new project from scratch. In particular, if you're starting a new research project or a new design of experiment, you may want a new place to put your data. And this keeps track of all your data throughout your entire experiment. So I can create a new project simply by going to the um, Start New Project, File, New Project, and, it's, and it brings up a menu for starting the project, including the project name, where to store it on the hard drive, and I can define initialization and termination steps. So in my project, if I'm going to run my project as a sequence automatically, I might want an initialization step that initializes my probe station, and a termination step that terminates my probe station, or starts my cryo chamber and ends my cryo chamber. Okay, so that's what the initialization and termination steps are. <coughs> so once I define the project, it starts with the project level in the project tree. And if I define it initialization termination steps, it puts those in there. Okay. Next, I have to uh, click on the subsite. So when I click on the subsite, it'll put a subsite underneath my project. Next, I click on the device. Once I click on the device, it will open the device window. I choose a pre-configured device. Remember, the devices are just bitmaps, right? So I choose a pre-configured device, and it will place the device under my subsite. Okay. Finally, I come to my test library, and I click on a test and it drops that test under my device. So if I chose a MOSFET device, I'm going to come to my MOSFET library in order to pull a pre-configured test out of that. So with just a few steps, I initiated the project, added a subsite to it, added a device to it, then added a actual test under that device. It's really four clicks, four clicks that maybe seem unnecessary if you just want to do one quick test, okay? But once you get used to them, it's click, click, click. It's very easy. And now you have an automation structure and a data management structure already put in place. Now, I'm not required to load a pre-configured test out of my test libraries. I can start from scratch and build my own tests and in fact, I think most people do. All right, so if I have a project and I want to add a new test, my test library is located in my subsite directory. So if I double click on the subsite level, it will bring up the test library directory. Now Keithley put all of our tests in a standard location on the test library. And that's what comes up by default. But what we'll see some people do is they will build their own, um, library of tests and put it in their own location, 
what we see some corporations do, international, multinational corporations, is they will create a corporate set of tests and all the sites around the world will come and pull from those tests. It'll be on a corporate server. Okay. Now, the only locations that show up in this test library pulldown are locations that were configured by the system administrator or by the user up at this level right here under the systems options tools, which you actually can't see in this slide. Okay. So you can define every location that will show up and only those locations will show up here. Also, at my subsite level, I can change the execution sequence. So when I've got multiple tests listed here, unfortunately, my project navigator doesn't allow me to actually click and drag my tests around or delete them. I have to come into the subsite window and then I can click a test and I can move it up or move it down. And once I do that, I click the apply button and that will uh, move the test around, move the sequence of the tests around. So I'd like to have a cut and paste and copy and drag and drop. It's just with the structure of our project navigator, it's, it's actually not possible. We have to do it in the subsite window. So the subsite window actually allows you to do that. Now, in order to run multiple tests or multiple ITMs, I don't actually have to have them open. I show here, I have them all open here in my multi-document interface, but that's not a requirement. As long as the checkbox is checked, if I click on the device level, it will show me the device right here. When I hit this run button, it will run every one of those tests. It will store the data in the sheets of those tests and it will uh, update the graphs of those tests. I can have all the tests open and I can have them windowed up here so I can see them or I don't have to have them open and windowed. It doesn't really matter. That's the important point is whatever shows up in this window up here is what will be executed or is executing at the moment, right? So if I click on this MOSFET and hit the run button, the tests will cycle through this window as they're each executed. So here is an example of where I actually tiled the, uh, actually it's not a tile, it's called, what's it called in Windows? Where you make multiple windows show up? Maybe it's tile, yeah. Um, I actually tiled uh, four of them on here, and then I click this, and you'll actually see the data update on, on all four of these. Four is about as many as you can get on our small front panel. If you go to a bigger display, you can actually get more tests and have them done. <clears throat> so, here's a review. The steps for creating the new project. You click the File menu, Create New Project. Then you've got these icons at the top of your system. You click the uh, subsite icon, the device icon, and finally the ITM icon. Click each of these icons in order and it will automatically come in and throw that and allow you to create a project in just four clicks. This will create a new um, ITM. This one will create a new UTM which starts as sort of a blank sheet, or you can come and pull a test in from the library. Oh, look at this animation that I didn't even know I had. Okay, so here was a, an example of a, of a diode curve. Um, also on this particular diode curve, we actually created this uh, just uh, as, as a VF and a VR on a diode. It took us just a few clicks to create a couple of diode curves. We actually pulled this in from um, our project library, and this actually has a, uh, a, a fit built into it from the library. 
If I wanted to, I could come in and right click on this scale, which would open up this scale menu, and I could then set the axis limitations, particularly if I was wanting to compare to a data sheet or some other thing that had a fixed set of axes. And that's actually a good tip for you, something I see in, in a lot of papers that I see published. People will show me comparative data, but they'll put them on two different axis scales. You know, and I, I'm, I'm reading a, a paper and they're on different axis scales. It's almost impossible to actually compare the results on that. So, you know, I, I always recommend, if, you know, when you're publishing the results of your research, you know, and you want to do comparative graphs, make sure the scales match. I want to take just a minute and tell you about our file management system. Um, our project navigator manages all the files for you. And most people find they never have to go outside of the project navigator. But it's worth just taking a second to show you how our project navigator actually manages files. So the 4200 operating software, model 4200 kite software, it all exists in a directory, a root directory called S4200. Under the S4200 root directory, we have multiple users. In this case, we have the KI user, which is the standard location for the KI user logon. Under KI user, we have several directories called devices, projects, tests, and user libs. So this is all the device libraries, the bitmaps of the devices. This is the default location for all the projects. This is where all projects will reside unless somebody tells them to go somewhere else. Tests includes all of our standard test libraries and user libraries includes all of our standard user libraries. This is the code generated using our Keithley user library tool. So projects is where all of your data will reside. Okay. So all um, devices will reside under the device subdirectory. And a device actually consists of three files. It consists of a big bitmap, a little bitmap, and a definition file. So if you wanted to create yourself a new device, uh, the one created recently was a carbon nanotube device. You can take a bitmap, put it into our bitmap format. You can go take a look at our definition file and see how we defined it. And you can create your own device and stick it right here in the library and everybody has access to it. You can create any device you want. Most people don't go to that much trouble to create a custom device. They just use a generic device. Remember, a device is nothing but a bitmap. Doesn't define your test. It only limits the number of terminals that are on your test. Okay. So I often just use a custom device, which is a multi-terminal block of square. Okay, our application file and test results all reside in the projects subdirectory. Um, the projects subdirectory contains the default kite project, so if you're like many people, you work in the default project, right? If you wanted to go find where your actual data resided, you go to the project subdirectory and look for the default subdirectory, okay? Um, by default, people store things there unless they do a save project as and put them somewhere else, okay? Projects consist of multiple files stored in this predefined directory. Projects can be moved from one location to another. I think Purdue has five of these systems now. If you wanted to take a project off of this system and put it on another system, you would want to move the entire project subdirectory. Okay. Projects can be emailed, but we recommend you zip up the project subdirectory and then you email it. They can unzip it and they get the entire project subdirectory. So Kite is built around the project navigator. It manages everything, manages the bitmaps, manages the data files, manages the test files, the graph files, you know, it's all contained in the project subdirectory. The project subdirectory is named 
with the name that's at the wafer level or at the top called the project level. Okay, so here's an example. The 4200 subdirectory, the projects subdirectory, the default project, which includes devices, subsites, and tests. The tests actually has a directory called data, which actually has the Excel files in it, as well as the graph definition files. So if you wanted to see the data, you wanted to see the Excel files, you would click all the way down here to the data subdirectory and up would come all the .xls files representing all the tests and dot the, the .kgs files which is, which is the Keithley graphic file which defines the graph. It says take the Excel file and turn it into this graph. So we don't actually store the bitmaps, we just store a definition of the graph. Okay. So all Excel files in the entire default project are all here in one data subdirectory. If you wanted to share this project with somebody, you would click at the default level, zip it up, and send it to them, and they would get everything. They'd get all the bitmaps, they'd get all the graphs, they'd get all the data, they'd get all everything. If you just wanted to go down, if you had a whole bunch of Excel files and you wanted to go mess with your Excel files, you'd have to come all the way down to the data directory, and here's all your Excel files down here. Now, how did we generate our file names? The file name is generated like this. Here, let's pick a nice file here. Okay, here's an IGVG. There's a gate current versus gate voltage. So this test would be named in the project IG-VG. It has a unique ID on it, pound one. Remember, we had the file name with a unique ID because we can have multiple project, multiple tests with the same name. There could be multiple IGVGs in there, but each one would have a unique identifier, pound one. And then they would have an at one after that, dot XLS. So the pound one is unique ID. The at one is the looping level. We can loop entire projects multiple times. So if you could envision looking at the project tree, we can loop it. We can have multiple trees. We call those sites. And each site is the at. So you can have an at one, at two, at three. That would be the third project, the fourth project, the fifth project. That's our entire naming structure. That's how we can generate a million file names and manage them without actually having you go in to generate the names. All right, let's talk briefly about the user test module as contrasted to an interactive test module. Remember that the interactive test module was something that was a uh, uh, point and shoot. You just fill in the blanks and, and it's ready to run. You can pull them out of the library, you can create them from scratch. User test module is identical, except what a user test module is literally is a dynamic link library. It's a dynamic link library that somebody wrote and compiled and turned it into a user test module. And then they stuck it in the library and made it available to you. So you can take a user test module and drop it right into your project and it operates and thinks and acts just like an interactive test module. The only difference is instead of having a point and shoot graphical user interface, it actually just has a fill in the blanks interface. Okay. Now, the advantage of the user test module is it has low level control of the instruments and can go outside the box and talk via GPIB to external instruments. We discussed that earlier about Keithley's quasi-static meter. Um, there are libraries in here to control external quasi-static meters, electrometers, voltmeters, uh, cryo chambers, probe stations. All of these are user test modules or user libraries that have been written, compiled, and put on the system. So you insert a user test module in exactly the same way that you inserted an interactive test module. 
You simply click on the user test module icon and it will pop up and tell me the name. What do you want to call this user test module? And it shows up under your um, subsite as a user test module. Now, when it shows up as a user test module, when you open it, it's empty. It's an empty user test module. And what you'll have is you'll have a user library and a user modules drop down. The user library drop down will give you a full list of every user library currently available on this instrument. Keithley supplies it with in the neighborhood of 50 or 60 user libraries. We've got user libraries for CV meters, user libraries for probe stations. So you pick a user library. You can't quite see it, but here's a user library for the Keithley 595 quasi static meter. Okay. When you pick a user library, then you come down and you pick a user module in the library. A module is an individual test in the library. A library might consist of multiple modules. You might consider a module almost to be a subroutine, but it's really not a subroutine. It's really a fully contained test module that is in a library. There's really no limit to the number of modules you can have in a library. But one UTM is one library and one module out of that library. So once you pick the library, you pick the module list that comes up with that library. Now you have that UTM, that compiled piece of code ready for you to um, fill in the blanks. In this case, we cho chose the beep lib library and we chose the beep module. It just makes a nice beep on the display. Okay. And once we've done that, what comes up is the standard ITM screen. Now, an, a, a, a UTM and ITM are identical in that they have a definition, a sheet, a graph, and a status. So from that perspective, they look exactly the same. The only difference is a UTM has a different look and feel. It doesn't have a graphical user interface that you select the instruments. What it has is it just has um, inputs to a dynamic link library. So it's got input variables and output variables. And all this is is a very simple interface that says you've got to enter the inputs. In this case, this is the switch matrix user library. And it says, what do I want on terminal string one, SMU one connected to pin number three? Okay. So, so this, uh, whoever wrote this user library defined the inputs and the outputs to this dynamic link library. Now, if they were a good coder, they would put notes down here in the notes section and tell you what the different inputs and outputs mean. Okay. And Keithley does that. Every one of our user libraries is fully annotated down here as to what every input and output is. All right. So you come in here, you enter all your inputs that defines the test. And then when you go and execute this test, it will pour the data into the sheet and into the graph in exactly the same way that an ITM does. The only difference is the underlying code, the underlying execution is done with a different execution engine, one that requires the program or the library to be written in our C programming shell and then compiled and then it's made available to whoever wants to use it. Now, once you've compiled it, you can distribute that to any other 4200 user. You can just send them the user library and they can execute. It shows up in their ITM. They can execute. They don't have to recompile it. They don't have to look at the source code. They don't have to know C programming. Okay. It's just a low level access to the 4200 instruments. We have a question. Uh, so usually every ITM does it have a UTM file associated with it? Like, is that how you generate your user libraries? Like under the uh, 590, let's say, mm -hmm. is there a UTM that's been pulled up and compiled, which does the exact same thing as the ITM default test for the CD? Okay. 
Let me repeat the question for our, our video. The question is, does every ITM and UTM have a corresponding set of code? In other words, um, have the ITMs been translated to UTMs or have UTMs been translated to ITMs? That's a, that's a very good question. The answer is no. They were, the, the two different tests were devised for two different reasons. So the ITM was originally devised as a simple graphical user interface to give you access to the internal instruments only, the SMUs, and then later the CVU and the ultra fast IV came along. ITMs have direct access to those. UTMs were designed in to give you access not only to the internal instruments, but also to external instruments. Now, as it turns out, they have two different execution engines. The ITM has its own execution engine, which does things in its own way, and it has nothing to do with the C code in the UTM. The UTM C code and programming environment was actually modeled after Keithley's production parametric testers, a very mature parametric test language that Keithley has used in production tests for 20 years. That's the Keithley user library tool. Right. So there's an ITM, like, let's say the high frequency C Right. And I want to make a slight modification to it, but I don't want to go through the entire process of writing the code out from scratch. So if there was a corresponding, I'm not saying the ITM is going to use that UTM to actually execute the test, but if there was just a corresponding UTM that does the same thing that this ITM does, I can just make small changes in the code and recompile and have my own new test. Right? Okay, so I know what you're asking, but let me let me clarify the, the question that you're actually asking a little bit. Because you're talking about controlling an external CV meter, the old Keithley Model 590, mm -hmm. right? The old Keithley Model 590, which is now obsolete, um, is not controlled from an ITM. So when you make the statement, you know, if I control the 590 from an ITM, that's an incorrect statement. The 590 is only controlled from a UTM. Keithley supplied a user library with multiple modules to control the 590. So when you take that UTM and you put it in your project and you fill in the blanks and you hit the run button, it goes out to GPIB, sets up the 590, 590 hands the GPIB data back and puts it in the sheet tool and that puts it in the graph tool and puts it in the formulator. The user libraries and the modules that Keithley supplied for the 590, we also supplied you the underlying source code. So your question was, if I wanted to do something with the 590 UTM that is not currently supported in the UTM, whoever wrote it didn't support what I wanted to do, then do I have the source code? The answer is yes, you do. And you can go into that source code and Keithley, we went to a lot of pain to actually annotate our source code. So it should be well documented. You should be able to figure out what we're doing. You can change that source code, recompile it, and now you can use it as your own user library or your own module. Now, what we recommend is that you would take the, the KI590U lib, which is our supplied user lib, and you copy it over to a new name. Leave our user library <sighs> the way it was, okay? And cop it to a new name and then you can rework it, recompile it, do everything. You have a whole new user library. And here's why you do that. When you upgrade from Kite 7 to Kite 8 to Kite 8.1, whatever, we put all of our user libraries back in there. So if you've modified my user library and have changed it and kept my same name, all that will be gone when you upgrade. And we warn you before we do it, but you know, you don't want to modify my stuff and leave it with my names on it. What you want to do is start with my libraries, copy them over, and then um, work on it from there. So that would be a very good way to modify our 595 uh, program. I think our 595 program has a <coughs> fixed level pulse on it. You could go in and put a loop around that to say, set the voltage and do a fixed level pulse, giving me the data back until it's what I like, and then go to the next voltage. That would be a great starting point for that uh, particular program. Another question? Uh, if for some reason you're more comfortable with UTM or, you know, like that, every ITM can be 
X or yeah, every ITM can be done as a UTM as well, right? Okay, so the, the question is, can we do everything in the ITM in a UTM? The answer is yes. The UTM has low level access to everything the instrument can do. So the sweeps, the nested sweeps, everything that you can do in an ITM, you could go into a UTM and program those yourself directly if you wanted to do that. The advantage would be you could actually go in there and do things that the GUI didn't let you do. For instance, the GUI cannot make decisions on the fly doing future um, tests based on past results. But you can write anything you want in the UTM. So in the UTM, you could be sweeping, looking at the data, saying, oh, I see my data has reached a certain threshold. I want to do something different, so I'm going to come over here and reprogram this and take off and do something else. ITM has no decision-making capability. You could make decisions in a UTM in real time. So, um, but it's, it's important to point out because this is a common misconception. There is no ITM to UTM code generator. I've been asked for it for years. I, I would love to have it. It just never happened. Be neat if you had a button that said, take my UTM and generate the code. Now I've got that great code and I'm going to go modify it. Doesn't exist yet today, but hopefully someday it will. Um, again, the UTM's um, execution engine is a different execution engine than the ITM. And we, we had to do that just because of the way we structured the ITM and the UTM. The UTM had to have low level access and had to be compatible with a different tester. And the ITM had a certain set of GUI functions it had to fulfill. So we gave them two separate execution engines. So because of that, um, it is possible that you might get slightly different results based on timing or other differences if you wrote your own code to duplicate an ITM. Right. The underlying engine for the UTM is called LPT LIB. It stands for Linear Parametric Test LIB, and it's a dynamic link library that has a number of calls to the low-level function of the instrument. Okay. And then those calls are shells, the Keithley User Library tool, which is a C shell, which gives you a nice structured environment and takes care of managing all the libraries and everything for you. There's a really nice tutorial in our manual. Uh, if, if, if you are already familiar with C programming and you go read this tutorial, you'll be up to speed in, in a half an hour on writing your own user libraries. If you're not familiar with C programming, you probably don't want to do that. <laughs> C programming is not for the weak of heart. Yeah. All right. I uh, wanted to point out our help menu. Um, the 4200 has the help menu accessible from the F1 key, which launches the, what we call the Keithley complete reference. The complete reference is a complete reference. It's, it's many megabytes of reference material. It includes the product manuals for the 4200 and the 590, the 595, a number of external Keithley instruments. It includes data sheets, application notes, uh, tutorials, uh, user guides. Um, most of these are in PDF format and are searchable. It's a little bit daunting at first. You come to the complete reference material and there's so much material you go, how can I ever find what I need? But once you get used to poking around sort of the file structure and then open the PDF and the, you got great PDF search tools in there, it really is is a, a great way to get uh, reference. Now, we also reference in here, we tell you exactly how to connect things. We've got troubleshooting guides. We've got uh, low-level measurement guides. Uh, we've got appendices for external instruments like probe stations, how to automate probe stations or thermal chucks. So it is, it is really a lot of data. The complete reference is also part of the desktop version of Kite. So if you order the desktop version of Kite, which is free and can be loaded on any Windows XP computer, we haven't tested it yet on Windows 7, 
Don't know if it'll work or not, but it works on any XP computer. When you load it, the complete reference goes on there also. So you, you'll be able to have the complete reference on your laptop or your, your desktop at home and you can refer to it without actually being in the lab on the tool.